This is Creality's new CR10 Smart. In this review, we'll find out if it really is smart or whether it's actually more deserving of a dunce cap. I'm really fussy over which machines I agreed to review, and I have rejected many Creality offerings until finally agreeing to this one. So why did I say yes? This machine is $100 cheaper than a CR10S Pro V2, but it still comes with ABL, Dual Z, and it also has built-in Wi-Fi connectivity. I asked my patrons if they were also interested, and they said yes. So here we are, and we're going to start by looking at the specs. The CR10 Smart is the latest from Creality's popular line of CR10 3D printers. It retails for $500 US dollars from the official Creality web store. The merits of this printer boil down to seven key improvements. The first is built-in Wi-Fi functionality, an ultra-silent design with quiet fans, the auto bed leveling system from the CR6 SE, auto shutdown, power saving, and quick assembly. One of the main features is a bit more intelligence, and I have no idea what that's meant to mean. Its interface is through a color touchscreen, it has a 32-bit mainboard, and it automatically shuts down after 30 minutes of idle time. The visual styling is also inspired by what I think is a Lamborghini. Other little details are these braces at the back, and dual steppers for the Z-axis. This machine was provided free of charge by Creality for the purpose of review after they agreed to my review policy. And as the policy says, all problems will be included in the review and we will be covering some significant ones later on. For now, however, let's move on with unboxing and assembly. The printer arrived without damage, thanks to the usual combination of cardboard and foam packaging. Assembly was pretty straightforward. There's two main components, comprising of the upper and lower halves. A series of bolts join them together, and then the rest of the assembly is quite simple, including the braces at the back, plugging in cables, and installing the filament spool holder. All up, I'd say it takes around 15 minutes. For people that like it, you do get the satisfaction of peeling off three separate plastic sheets. The user manual, for the most part, is quite good, with clear instructions, clear diagrams, and it made assembly quite straightforward. It covers much more than assembly, most of it good, but there are some sections that were lackluster, which we'll get to later on. In terms of tools and spares, they're contained in this built-in drawer on the left-hand side of the machine. To me, this seems like a pretty tidy solution. In the packaging was also this mystery piece, which I later worked out was meant to be a guide tube between the filament runout sensor and the entry to the extruder drive. To turn on the machine, we need to switch on the power at the back and then hold down this button on the side, which brings the LCD to life. For the most part, it's well laid out and it's pretty easy to find what you're after. For the duration of my testing, it was mostly reliable. Before we print, we're meant to start the auto bed leveling sequence, which heats the nozzle to 120 degrees and then uses the nozzle to probe 16 points on the printer's bed. This process is agonizingly slow and uses the same sensor as the CR6 SE, a strain gauge above the nozzle with the nozzle flexing upwards and activating the trigger point. Movements are slow and each point probes multiple times, so eventually it will finish and we will be talking about the auto bed leveling a great deal more later in the video. The extruder design is exactly the same as the CR6. Swing the latch to take the pressure off, load your filament, and just don't forget to close the latch again before you start printing. The hot end design is definitely more compact than the CR6, despite having the same strain gauge that allows the auto bed leveling. The PTFE tube doesn't go very far into the top, but that doesn't mean that it's an all metal hot end, as the heat break is quite thick, and I think that means there's tube inside it. Inside the electronics case, things do look pretty tidy. This is the first Creality printer I've used with this particular 32-bit mainboard, and I do recognize this as the innards of a Creality box. Interestingly, it seems Creality is now making, or at least branding, their own power supplies. The files on the SD card are quite comprehensive, with a range of pre-sliced models for testing out the machine, a digital copy of the user manual, a troubleshooting guide to address common issues that people experience when 3D printing, and a very welcome addition, a guided assembly video to assist the user in putting the machine together. Probably the most important thing is the installation files for the slicer. Creality once again are using Creality Slicer, which is simply a skinned version of Cura. This and all of their other machines are set up ready to go, 
with pre-made slicing profiles to suit four different layer heights and support for a range of different materials and I found these profiles quite good and needed minimal changes in my testing of various filaments for this review. I completed a range of test prints in a variety of materials, so let's inspect them now. I started by printing some of the pre-sliced G-code with the included filament, and we pressed the plus to bring up the files, select the name, and then hit play. The first test print was in fact a failure, and that's because the heated bed temperature was too low. After restarting and overriding this temperature on the LCD, the print stuck and was able to be completed successfully. The surface finish is quite glossy and nice, but it does have a little bit of stringing. Overall, not a bad first result. The next SD print was called Pot of Greed, and for some reason the printer didn't home after finishing it, so it stuck to the nozzle. This one printed with support, and I was able to remove it with my bare hands. The surface finish once again looks quite good, but this print suffers from quite pronounced stringing, especially on the inside. Time to slice my own models, starting with the humble 3D Benchy. I would only describe this Benchy as reasonable. The seam from where the new layer starts is quite prominent, and we can tell the retraction needs more tuning as there's more finer wisps as we saw on the other models. Beyond that, it seems pretty crisp, and it at least gets a pass. To test tolerances and accuracy, I got this vintage Nissan Skyline model from Fab365. This is one of those awesome models that prints in place without support and then you take it off the build plate, loosen the pieces and fold it to assemble it. I was having issues with first layer consistency which you'll soon see was not my fault and unfortunately that ruined the accuracy of the print. After wrestling with the print for some time I got it mostly together but the result is just not up to the same as I've achieved on other machines due to the inconsistent first layer. Moving on to this origami vase and I like printing vases because they show single wall extrusion quality. These gaps at the bottom can be ignored, they're due to the overhang and only having a single wall, but the rest turned out pretty cleanly. One thing that I did notice were the tips of these points being quite bulbous, and I put this down to far too conservative acceleration settings preset into the printer. Apart from that, this vase passes the test because there's no surface artifacts or repeating patterns. To test out fine details as well as more organic shapes, I loaded up this black cake bust from Eastman, an outstanding 3D modeler with many files on my mini factory. This model with some X3D Diamond Pro PLA turned out quite well, the only defect being some very fine stringing in between the creases of the hair and clothing. Part cooling wasn't an issue on the finer features and the surfaces are free of any artifacts save for the Z seam which could do with some optimization. So how about some different filaments, starting with this toothpaste squeeze holder in PETG. The printer had no problem with the higher temperatures and the PETG stuck quite well to the glass bed. And if you're wondering what this does, you insert the end of your toothpaste roll into the middle, slide it into the larger portion, and then rotate the center to squeeze the toothpaste into the top of the tube. To test out flexibles, I printed this very cool looking flexible chair design. Using 95A Shore Hardness TPU, the default print speed settings were slow enough that the printer had no troubles with this filament. Both ends of the chair did lift slightly from the bed, which created all these artifacts, but you can see in the middle here where the print was still attached that we have some pretty clean extrusion, so this printer has no trouble with flexibles. To try out ABS, I selected this simple winder cable tidy design, as I expected it would expose any first layer issues with the ceramic coated glass bed. I've never found these types of bed good for ABS in the past, and so it proved again. After some fine tuning, I did get the first layer to go down successfully, but inevitably, as the print went on, it started to peel off the bed, just holding on until the print was done. So yes, technically you can print ABS, but this machine is really not optimized for it. One of the features that gives this name its smart title is the auto bed leveling system, and unfortunately for this machine, it was a complete disaster. I noticed from the very first prints from the SD card that the first layer was nice on the left but far too close on the right and was damaging the bed. For the early prints I could get away with this, but when it came to the larger vase, I was running into multiple failures. So clearly the glass bed was tilted, but this shouldn't matter right? This printer is advertised as having advanced auto bed leveling. Well based on my testing, no compensation for an uneven bed is ever applied. The first clue comes from inspecting the pre-sliced G-code on the SD card. G28 is there for homing, but there's no new commands to either probe the bed or restore a saved mesh. 
The same goes for the start G code for the provided slicing profile. So I turned to my calibration site and prepared a first layer test, trying out the various ABL options. Even when I opted to have the bed probe immediately before printing, and then adjusted the Z offset as the first square went down, it was clear no mesh compensation was being applied. The initial square was good, the back left too far away, the center far too close, and on the right hand side I had to stop it because it was just grinding the glass. Baffled, I asked Reality what the problem might be, but their response confused me even more. Pause it if you want to read the whole thing, but basically they said that the bed had gone out of level during shipping, and that I should try and fix it mechanically. Isn't compensation for a warped or slanted bed exactly what ABL's meant to do? That's what Creality advertised, so now I'm wondering whether this machine actually has it activated in the firmware. So I needed to manually level the bed, but of course there are no leveling knobs. Therefore, the only other solution was tedious and time consuming, and involved disassembling the bed and using a combination of precision shims and ordinary washers to pack underneath the plastic spaces and attempt to get the thing trammed. This took a few goes, but once it was done, I could set my height with the Z offset tool and I was finally able to print a decent first layer. Not perfect, but pretty consistent across the five points. This was a tedious process for me, so what on earth would a beginner do faced with this situation? The other main feature that makes this printer smart is the inbuilt Wi-Fi. Fortunately, that fared a little bit better. So we know inside that it uses a Creality box instead of a Raspberry Pi. And this is something I've made a complete video about before, where I found it paled in comparison to the features of Octoprint. One key problem is that it just wouldn't connect to the majority of my printers. So are things any better when it's inside the CR10 Smart? To use the Wi-Fi functionality, you're going to need to locate and download Creality Cloud for your phone or tablet. After that, you're going to need to make an account with the service with one of your email addresses. After that, we can add the machine to the app by scanning the QR code. We tell the printer our network Wi-Fi details and after a few minutes, it will be online. From in the app, we can now select one of the jobs available from the list. And if you want to preview the files that are available without installing the app, I've got this site linked below in the description and more on it later. We can now select our printer from the list of Creality models available and if we like, we can customize some of the settings. The model slices in the cloud and then downloads to the machine where it will start immediately. Inspecting the machine will show that everything's heating up, but there's no other indication that a print job has started. This particular job ultimately failed because of poor part cooling, and perhaps I could have noticed this and stopped the print job early if the webcam that I plugged in that works with every version of Octoprint worked with this machine, but it seems they only want you to use a Creality webcam. Probably a better way to use the cloud system is to install the Creality Cloud integration plugin into their version of Cura. You can then connect your version of Creality Slicer to the Creality Cloud app, and that means direct upload to your machine without leaving your computer. Using this method, I was able to slice, upload, and print successfully. But this will be the last time that I feature anything to do with Creality Cloud until they fix a glaring problem. You'll notice that the first design I printed clearly states it's not their design and it's taken from elsewhere on the internet. In my opinion, pretty much all of the models on the Creality Cloud have been stolen in this way. For some of them, it's obvious to the point that they still have the Thingiverse thumbnails. Others only have the model and seem to be uploaded by throwaway accounts who are actively stealing these models without any attribution. I've complained to Creality about this in the past, but unfortunately the problem's only gotten worse. My advice would be to search this site and make sure none of your own content has been taken. So that was my experience with the printer, so let's summarize some strengths and weaknesses. This printer has a lot of problems, but we need to be fair and identify its strengths. The first being the assembly that was pretty straightforward. The provided slicer and inbuilt slicing profiles were also easy to use. And ultimately, the print quality on the majority of my models was quite reasonable. The profiles just need a little bit of tweaking to dial in retraction. The touchscreen interface does a good job in the majority of situations. Models generally stuck well to the glass bed and self-released once they'd cooled down. And I have no complaints about the extruder, which is easy to operate and had no problems printing flexible TPU. This should be an automatic inclusion, but I was pleased to confirm that the printer ships with working thermal runaway protection. 
onto the problems and the list is long, starting with the ineffective auto bed leveling system. It's completely unacceptable that a user should have to disassemble a new printer just to be able to print anywhere but the middle. Creality advertised using silent fans, but I would disagree with this. The stepper motor drivers are in fact silent, but the damage is done with the fans. Another complaint I have is that the machine is agonizingly slow to use. This goes for homing, probing, and sending through filament from the LCD screen, which is slow to the point that you wonder whether your input has been registered. The printing is also very slow, with this SD card print taking over 10 hours, and this Benchy sliced with the pre-made profile taking almost 2 hours. Heating performance for the bed and the nozzle is also agonizingly slow, to the point where it feels like maybe they haven't PID auto-tuned. In fact, when I was testing ABS, it took about 17 minutes for the bed to hit 100. Overall, I have a strong sense that this is a machine that has been rushed and not properly tested. The UI has bugs, such as the temperature sometimes not being able to be manually set, and included in the packaging is this warning to not home X and Y before homing Z. But the printer's own touchscreen only offers separate homing buttons, which means when X and Y is homed by itself, the part cooling fan collides with the bed. And when I tested filament runout protection, the system did register that the sensor had triggered, but there's no on-screen controls to be able to back out the old filament, so my only option was to cancel the print. The solution to this is that they either fix the interface on the touchscreen, or you remove this clear filament guide, and that will give you enough access to use pliers to pull the filament out manually. The power up protection did seem more promising, with the machine detecting the power cut when it was switched back on and offering to resume the print. But remember, these glass beds self-release the model when they cool, so by the time everything got back up to temp, it was inevitable that the model would be knocked clear. This last one for me is a real deal breaker. The port on the side can only be used for inputting a webcam. I tested it with my PC and Octoprint, but we know from looking at the inside that the port goes to the Creality box, and the mainboard's USB port is connected to the Creality box too, which means there's no way to connect to Octoprint, Printerface, or any other terminal software to manually control and configure the printer. Overall, I feel this machine is a wasted opportunity, and the non-functional ABL is an example of Creality releasing something before it's been properly tested and developed. I recently made a video asking the community what they wanted in new 3D printers, and so many people wanted proper quality control. But this seems like yet another occurrence where early adopters become unofficial beta testers, and that's really not good enough. If you agree with me, then please let me know in the comments. It's so frustrating because just a few simple changes would have made this printer so much better. Firstly, working ABL, that should go without saying. Secondly, fans that are actually quiet. And thirdly, a different approach to the internet connectivity. Instead of having a Creality box on the inside, let's instead imagine we had an opening compartment like the tool drawer. But this compartment was actually a dock for a Raspberry Pi. There would be a cable supplied for a good 5 volt power source, as well as a USB cable going back to the main board. That means we could easily run Octoprint, use whatever webcam we want, and we also have access to all of the community Octoprint plugins. I'd hope that this would be cheaper to make, because the user supplies their own Pi, and that cuts down on Creality hardware. That's my thoughts based on my experience, and others may have a better or worse one than me, so as always, watch as many reviews as you can before you're going to drop $500 on a new 3D printer. And please let me know what you think about this machine and my experiences in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, I hope you have a happier time 3D printing than I did. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe, and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.